It's the 27th of November 2018. I'm David Griffin. I'm here at the Hardwick Inn in the heart of Derbyshire. And I'm talking to... Rob Davis. And Phil Matthews. Gents, this is probably the most surreal recording <laughs> I've ever done. Because we are surrounded by Christmas music. Yeah. Um, and I'm rather hoping that our voices will be resonant and loud. So Absolutely. That, you know, it's, cool. it's Jonah Lewis at the moment. <laughs> Um, but just to tell our audience, we, we're talking to, to two people from Blackpool Colliery Cricket Club. Um, and hopefully we're going to get some stories and some tales about the club. If I could start you off, James, um, how far back in, in time does Blackpool Colliery Cricket Club go? So we were founded, and we can... 1892. Right. So 1892, we were found by a doctor, Dr Goodall, who practised in Heath Village. Uh, not far from me, uh, and he was the medical officer at the Glatwell Colliery itself. Right. And basically, got talking to a lot of people around there who were interested in playing cricket, and that's where the club started. So it's been trading since 1892. So presumably, then it would have been solely coal miners. So it was solely coal miners, and looking at the archives that I've got access to, basically, there's lots of meetings and discussions between various elements of the colliery in different departments, you'll know more about that than me, but basically the different divisions inside there, different shifts, all wanting to play cricket, and that's really where the club was formed from. And do you know how many teams the, the club would have put out at that time, and what kind of opposition they were playing? Yeah. I, I think there was just, just the one initially. There was. Uh, it, and then they amalgamated or took over one of the local youth clubs. Yeah. Youth clubs were big in those days, yeah. weren't they? So we played uh, in the. They became the second team. Right. We played in the 1893. We played in the Derbyshire and Notts Cricket League, and then we went into the Scarcliffe and District League before we went into the Derbyshire League in 1901. That's interesting because a lot of teams that were formed in the 1800s played lots of friendly. Cricket, yeah. Didn't they? But clearly. No, we. Blackwell were happy to go straight. They into, went straight in. Straight I think into leagues. Exactly. We've got yeah. very. To be honest, that period up to the 1920s, that was the strongest in terms of results right. that the club ever had. So, in terms of you know the league and everything that we played in, we won the Derbyshire League three times in 1919, 22, and 29. Runner up four times. We won cup competitions all in that period. So we were the Sheepbridge Cup from Chesterfield. We won that four times in the 1929s area. And I know you're talking in the near future to Whitwell, we were tied with them for the Bassett Law League, which right. started in 1930s. So yeah, we, you know, we were a very successful club at that stage. And was there any movement to players in those days, or did players yeah. still start? I mean, it, even, even looking at when I started, uh, when I was 13, 52, mid-60s, very few mm. people moved from from club to club, yeah. as they seem to do now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of it was financially based, or oh, it is now. Yes. Um, people move for a few bob more than what they're getting where they where they're playing currently. But, but in, that, in those days, they didn't. They yeah. came from the village, and they stayed in the village to play the sport. And they worked at the colliery. They yeah. worked at the colliery. Yeah. Oh, you are the, so, yeah. So oh, who were they playing at the turn of the? 19th to 20th century, because obviously transport would have been a yeah, uh, big issue. I mean, some of the sides mentioned in this, uh, the literature I've got, Claycross, Hardwick Hall, so Hardwick Colliery, yeah. which I actually started playing with at the back of Hardwick Hall. Right. We, they were in the league at that stage that we played against, which I didn't realise, I must admit, until I read this. Um, other sides were Shybrook uh, that we were playing against only a few miles down the road. Um, as well, so people like that were there. We also were, I think, sides from Chesterfield area to Sheepbridge. Uh, um, presumably, in. these would have been all connected by railway, wouldn't they? Yeah. Because of the, yeah. the colliers. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, and at that stage, we'd actually got some people from who actually were ex Derbyshire players as well who oh, were right. coming who in. Were they then? So we got Fred Newton and Johnny John Gladwin. Right. So they played in the Father 20s. Cliff, yeah. So they played in the 20s, 30s and early 40s until the Second World War started. And then uh, Fred Newton went to work, went to play for Warsaw Main Colliery um, in the 20s. But then we'd got other brothers, Hunt brothers, who all were in the 20s as well. And then we started getting the, some younger ones through in the mid-30s, the 1930s, when 
one of our most famous players, Cliff Gladwin, uh, started playing for us. So he actually lived down in Dow Lee, yeah. which is only a couple of miles away from and where we actually started playing. But Cliff ended up representing England. Yeah. Um, so Cliff played here before he played for Derbyshire? It, it was during, yeah. So he started playing for Glatwell and then went on to, Glo on to Derbyshire. So the information I've got is that he, he took 1,600 wickets, played eight times for in the 40s for England. And I th it says it's one of the distinctions is being involved in the th most thrilling of test match finishes as he scrambled a leg by off the That's right. first test in South Africa in 48-49. Yeah. That's when he used the fra allegedly used the phrase as he walked out to bat, come the hour, come the hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, that's that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating yeah. because I, I have no idea at all that. Yeah, that and means he, Antecedent, so well, and I think his family as a whole. So we, I think they were one of the few families where there was a father, son, and grandson, effectively, that's played yeah. for the club. So, what were the were colliery connections to the Gladwins? I think just the area. Dolly is literally a stone's throw from the colliery. Right. I, th I think the, the, colliery the chances are that the old man must probably yeah. have worked it by the. There was there were two collieries: were Blackwell and Bramley Vale. Yeah. Um, more or less adjacent to one another. Mm. Um, so, it, it, in all likelihood, he, he probably worked there, and, yeah. and that would be the connection to the, to the Collier, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I don't know. I must have so, how did, Collier cricket, how did the Collier Cricket Club work? Because you've got shifts. Yeah. So, presumably, people weren't all working the same shifts. So it, it was a combination. Looking at the information I've got, there's basically regular meetings that took place for the selection committee yeah. where they were working out who was working the shifts who would then be available, available for the game. So it was, it was a squad based It was, yeah, team. very much so. Years yeah. Yeah. I, but I, I think probably, I mean, I worked for British Coal obviously a lot later than this, but uh, the, even when I, when I was an apprentice and, and just starting out to, 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 for promotions and whatever, um, the most collieries had a, what they call an interdepartmental competition, yeah. and you'd get the surveyors would put a team together, all the different coal faces would put a team together, uh, the mechanics would, the electricians yeah. would, and then they'd have sort of an interdepartmental competition. Right. And I and I I feel that a lot of clubs probably amalgamated those who were keen to play yeah. Yeah. from all different aspects of the colliery. Uh, to create a colliery cricket yeah. club, and then they went out into the local world and played against mm. other colliers. Mm. I would imagine that's yeah. how it all started. And I think also we played at Dolly, which was actually next to the next to the yeah, colliery at that stage. That. So, so what the was ground, the arrangement with the ground? Was that given to you? Or, or no, we played down at Dolly yeah. till 1947. It was owned by the. Uh, the owners of the colliery, yeah. whoever that was, I can't remember yeah. who it was, because they were all privately owned in yeah. those days, pre NCV. Yeah. And, and, all that. Yeah. Uh, and they owned, they, they bought land for tipping purposes, right. for the spoil, yeah. from the waste. Yeah. From, and the, the first ground at Dole, as Phil said, right at the side of the river. Mm. If you hit a four, it went, it dropped into the river, <laughs> basically. It <laughs> only sort of this wide, it was yeah. stream. Uh, according to the people who I've spoken to, anyway, uh, and then the reason that we moved from there was that that piece of ground was going to be used to start tipping, tipping yeah. spoiler. Yeah. yeah. So you got together. So yeah. yeah, we had little choice. And what was the, 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 after the war? Forty-seven. We yeah. moved to the current ground. The, the current ground was actually built in that door in the wall. Mm. Right. They actually, they actually. You know, because they knew what was coming, presumably. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the pavilion as it is now, if you if you knock it down and get right down to the skeleton of it, it is the old pavilion from the Double E ground. That's it what, what, it up. They, and it's moved been, it yeah. and built round it. And yeah. then it's been built round. It's interesting it. that yeah. Stavely did that apparently. Somebody told uh, me they, they, they built wouldn't be surprised. Mm. Wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Which I, I suppose because you needed to keep a facility. Yeah. Yeah. You, you couldn't, you know. No, so, so how did you acquire the ground? Was it was that given to the club or? I think yeah, uh, by then it was Siswell would come into. Yeah. Siswell, which is yeah. the Colliery Institute and Welfare. Social welfare. Social welfare or something. Yeah. Um, 
and they bought up a lot of sports grounds associated with uh, cricket, cricket yeah. to, and cricket grounds associated with collieries. Um, as part of their sort of, must have been a remit, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and so our ground was owned by Ciswell. Right. It was Collier Institute and Welfare and something. <laughs> so what's that for? Something like that. Organisation. Yeah. Workers Association. Right, right. Um, and when, when, right up as far as into the early 90s, when the Collier is virtually disappeared overnight, mm. Ciswell still owned probably 100% of the yeah. grounds that right. Collier yeah. teams are playing on. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly owned ours. Uh, and mm. they then, after a few years, gradually started selling them off. Uh, in, an our, in our case, the local parish council bought the ground. We would have done, but we never got a mm. chance. They snapped their hand off as soon as they saw the deal they were getting. So we, we, uh, we missed out there, really, but uh, through no fault of his own. Mm. Uh, but that I think that's very sketchily how clubs came into being and, and then yeah. branched out yeah. and, and how the grounds became. So post war, how how um, successful or how big had the club yeah. become once the you know you'd moved grounds and, and we I'm were in which league at this point? Well, yeah, that's a good good point because we've flitted between various leagues with physically where we are. So the notes I've got were that we were in the Derbyshire League in the 40s when we started after the war, so 47 yeah. onwards. We stayed in the Derbyshire League and then we became members of the Bassett Law in 54. Was that a natural move really? Is, it, is that the obvious fit? It, it's a difficult one. I think we were in a bit of a cleft stick, uh, well we must have been, because of the geographical location. Yeah. We're right on the border of, of Notts and Derbyshire, although just into the Derbyshire yeah. side. Uh, and do you feel very much Derbyshire? I do. I, I mean, I, I don't come from <laughs> like, well, I come from Shirebrook, funny right. enough. And that's the same. Yeah. You can stand on the yeah, the just, bridge, yeah. which which leads out in the road towards Warset, Warset Vale, which are in knots. Yeah. Mm. And if you position yourself properly, you can have one foot in knots and yeah. one foot in Derbyshire, because the, the border runs right through the centre of the bridge. I know the feeling because uh, coming from Ilkeston, we, yeah, you know, we exactly. are absolutely yeah. 100% uh, Derbyshire. Yeah. But, but you are very, very close, as, as you yeah. just said. I think our, our part of our challenge is that, certainly nowadays, I think a lot of the members that we've got are from Mansfield area and that side, and they see themselves more as knots people yeah. than Derbyshire people. That's true. That's true. Um, so we, we, we've got a wide nucleus of where we're getting people from. but. We've gone all that way now, so quite from a cricketing perspective, a lot, a lot of us because we're playing in a Notts League, they see themselves as Nottinghamshire people, yeah. whereas probably we see ourselves as Derbyshire. You've said it's a Notts League, though, Phil. When I mean, when we started, when I started yeah, yeah, playing, certainly in the mid '60s, a lot of the colliery sides that we played against were all in the Derbyshire, Derbyshire yeah. coalfield. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and geographically, the Whitwood, yeah. they were yeah. in Derbyshire. Um, well, I mean, if you look at the Derbyshire, Derbyshire, Derbyshire League Derbyshire now, things like that. you could go through, a lot of sides have gone from the Bassett Law into Derbyshire. You've got Stavely Welfare, Chesterfield used to be in the Bassett Law. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Claycross, both the works and the other lot were as well. Cutthorpe, Eckington, were all in the Bassett Law. They've all had spells in the Bassett Law. Before yeah. they've gone well, into what Derbyshire. What always amazed me was how Matlock were in the Border League. Really? Matlock years and years ago in the Border League. Yeah, about 20 uh, okay. miles from I, th yeah. I think to a lot, to a lot of, in a lot of ways, it, it depended upon the probably the loyalties of the people who yeah, were running the clubs yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we had we we sort of flirted with we the did, idea yeah. of of going back into the Derby League. Out probably about 10, 10, 10, 12 20, years ago. 10, 15, yeah. something like that. And uh, I think years it's, ago. it's partly down to the do you, going back to your question, do you see yourself as Derbyshire? It's a difficult one because we do, but we don't. Yeah. Because of like the relationship with the cricket books. Yeah. You know, we we're seen as an outpost, really. Um, and so there's some methodology and logic in staying in the Bassett Law, even we're though we are we're a Derbyshire actually, based. We're actually an outpost club, if you like to call it that, for both the Derby League yeah, and, and the, the Bassett Law League. 
because we uh, must be one of the most westerly, west, yeah. westerly teams yeah. in the Bassett. There's only South Normanton that's further west than I that. mean, the Bassett Law district mm. and, and how that came into being, I don't really know, because it covers five counties. Mm. Um, I mean, it goes right us out virtually to Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. That, and you're still in the Bassett Law area. Yeah. So you can imagine what how many clubs there must have been at. at in fact, we probably will be at the, be that time. the furthest west because South Norman reckon, turn it back in in. I reckon we are the furthest, yeah. the, the, the f most westerly Bassett Law League yeah. club. Maybe Clay Cross. Did. No, they're not in it though now, are they? they, they oh, no, they moved, haven't they? Yeah. Both of them moved, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. of course. They've amalgamated, haven't they? Now, you've yeah. got on the, the yeah. table there, yeah. you've got a handbook of some of yeah. Is that something that's, that's, that's an something official that... publication? Or is it something no, it, it was going to be. Um, and the guy who put it together, it only spans the, dis the, the from the our, in, our inception up to 1941. Right. When the, the natural break occurred because of the... Uh, the war, yeah. and uh, the, the the chap that that's done this, Dave Slatcher, uh, he he put all the information together, and his intention was to put two or three of these together, covering different yeah. uh, area uh, eras, um, and he unfortunately he contracted cancer and and it killed him before he got chance, and he he put this one out quite quickly, I think. Mm. I think his intention was for it to be a little bit must be more professionally. Yeah. It must be invaluable. Right? Yeah. yeah. Social um, history as much as cricket. History. Well, yeah, I, I mean, just ask about the war years because was cricket still played? Because colliers yeah. were in reserved occupations. Was was did that allow for cricket to continue? We d we did. I don't think. No. Blackwell did. Right. No. I don't. I, and as I say, I I come from Shire, and I started playing when I was a kid at Shire, but I cannot recall anything that suggested that they carried on playing we, cricket no. uh, I know some in was, Leeds yeah, some, anyway. some was in they, they might have had the odd game they, yeah. the notes here that. that Dave put together basically put without break of second world war and a full discussion of ground not ready for use difficulty of travel into another ground and no. liberation of players no. they basically abandoned all hope of playing at yeah. 42 and we started again in 47 right so into our records, the war, yeah. the war interrupted it. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, going back on the history, the, there's some things here that Dave got together, which are articles out of the Derbyshire Times right. in the 1920s, and they're like basically going giving full match reports, similar to how it is today, effectively. Yeah. So we're, the reports in there actually read very similar to what to what's in the current day in the <laughs> Mansfield Chad, which covered our local cricket and Derbyshire Times. So it's amazing how it's not changed that much. No, it's vital that that publication, albeit not done the professional, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it survives. Yeah, I, res a, I actually a rescued it. As you can see, it's a bit dog-eared, and is a, <laughs> my missus were just about to chuck it in the bin <laughs> <laughs> when I spotted her. And uh, it's a project to mine, to be honest. To, to sort that's of, the, the way of a lot of cricketing and other memorabilia. Yeah, she, yeah. she was having one of her annual <laughs> we'll clean the garage out. Yeah, exactly. The only thing that she shifts is mask up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all interesting stuff, Josh. What we'll do is build a natural uh, place there to have a natural pause. And then what we'll do is we'll start to look at your own cricketing lives. And okay. But for now, gentlemen, okay. thank you very much.